Hi, I'm Morten Solvik, Vice President of Mahler Foundation and host and producer of the Mahler Hour, where we bring you the personalities, places, and projects happening right now in the Mahler community around the world. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our fourth season of the Mahler Hour. In the year ahead, we will continue to do our best to keep you up to date on Mahler events around the world. We will also be launching two new series. The first entitled Mahler's Orchestras. We'll take a close look at ensembles and Mahler that Mahler conducted in his time and that still play a major role in musical life today. The second will give us the chance to explore Mahler's works in greater detail. We will dedicate a program to each of the symphonies and Thomas Hampson and I will be going through a cycle of programs to talk about and savor the songs. Remember, you will be able to see all of these shows and all past Mahler hours on our website and on our YouTube channel. For this episode of the Mahler Hour, we are going to explore the conducting competition in Bamberg, Germany, the so-called Mahler competition, which took place again this year. This esteemed event has seen the rise of conductors like Kachu Wang, Lahab Shani, and Gustavo Dudamel, who won the first prize just as their careers were emerging. On the show today, I will be speaking with this year's winner, Giuseppe Mengoli, the co-founder of the competition, Marina Mahler, jury member and Mahler Foundation Chairman Martin Campbell White and Kevin Fitzgerald, the winner of a special prize of the competition. There's lots to cover, but before we get to the program, let me remind everyone attending live to post any questions you might have to the comments section. We will get to these at the end of our show. Don't forget to include your name and the country you are writing from. Also, the Mahler Hour is brought to you by Mahler Foundation. So if you want to support our activities, please become a member. Just go to our website at mahlerfoundation.org for all of the details. My first guest today is the winner of the Bamberg Model Competition 2023, Giuseppe Mengoli. Welcome and congratulations once again on winning this coveted prize. Thank you, dear Martin, and thank you for having me here. Well, first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, um, so I'm Giuseppe Mengoli, I'm a a 30 years old conductor and violinist. I uh, grew up in the south of Italy, in Salento, Puglia, and I have uh, studied um, violin, chamber music, and then in Germany, again, violin conducting for so many years. And I'm still finishing my, my master in conducting in Weimar. Um, I have experienced a lot of um, realities, orchestra playing, uh, or I, I played in banda, the trumpet, or I composed, I arranged uh, for, for a living. Um, so I, I've had a very various, um, a, a lot of variety in my formation years. So uh, you're not simply a conductor and you're a musician in, on so many fronts, both in terms of playing, conducting, uh, arranging, composing. Um, I suppose, I suppose, at some point, if you are a musician on so many fronts, conducting is a uh, is a thought that many many young musicians have. Um, what was it that actually brought you to take conducting at a far more serious professional level? Um, honestly, I have never thought about becoming a conductor until uh, some conductors and some musicologists told me that I, I definitely had um, a talent for it. And before that, I was always dreamed to be a, violin, a violinist and I played uh, a lot as a concertmeister. I started very early to be, to be a leader of orchestras. And, and there was a occasion uh, in particular uh, where I was left alone uh, with the orchestra because the conductor had a um, sudden jump in and could not attend uh, that rehearsal of Beethoven uh, fourth and seventh symphony and Coriolan. And I took the initiative just to um, ask the orchestra to rehearse anyway. And I didn't step on the podium. I stayed at my place and I tried to create uh, a lot of eye contact, a lot of um, breathing with the musicians. And that worked out very, very well. And when the conductor came back, he was astonished by, by the improvement of the orchestra. And, and there was another conductor as well watching the, the rehearsals. And he told me, you study conducting, right? And I, I was, no, I never did. So, so he said, well, then you're suited for it, definitely. And then I slowly started into uh, studying a lot of analysis, a lot of scores, a lot. I became, I became a collector of vinyls, of um, uh, LP uh, vinyls, and I started to get into um, 
um, deep traditions that sometimes I, I think today are forgotten of great conductors. And then slowly, slowly, I started a transition to, to becoming a conductor. So uh, more specifically, how did you uh, prepare for the competition in, in Bamberg uh, in July? <coughs> Apologies for the cough. Um, uh, that's, um, that's a long story. Uh, <laughs> I, I try to, um, to create uh, immediately, as soon as I, I got uh, the invitation, I started to write down lists of ideas, as, ma as many as possible. And also throughout the weeks, I wrote down a lot of ideas on how and what I could eventually do. And some things, of course, didn't happen, but a lot of things did happen. So, for example, I immediately... Um, so I purchased all the scores and, and I was already in the production of uh, Rosen Cavalier in, uh, in Amsterdam in, in my last assistantship uh, production and there was so much to do and I did not have time to practice for the competition but I tried in every break in every moment to study the scores first so to analyze the score that's that's my my um, standard procedure to start with a deep analysis of harmony of structure of um, micro micro phrases and and, and macro phrases. Uh, then I started to um, already organize a chamber orchestra to perform Mahler Seven, which I did privately. Um, I organized many rehearsals with uh, Stravinsky Violin Concerto. My violin teacher came all the way from Switzerland to play with me with an orchestra, just run through, as well as. Um, I rehearsed with a baritone in Paris when I was doing Bohème in May. I organized three rehearsals with a baritone and I taught him everything from scratch about text, about uh, in interpretation of, of, of meaning and uh, with the pianist, of course, and, um, and so on and so on. That, that, that was the practical, let's say, aspect of the preparation. And there was a huge also reinventing myself. I, I found myself, I mean, I think all, all the musicians do that, but. I found myself inadequate and I found myself not to be enough to be prepared for this competition. And so I, I started to reinvent my conducting technique. I started to reinvent my rehearsing, uh, like, like, a, like a practice uh, technique. It became a rehearsing technique. So I started to speak out loud. Every time I was doing a mistake in my, in my room, I started to um, talk out loud to the group I actually misconducted. So I was learning through rehearsing and then I was re-rehearsing from scratch plus the, the skills that I acquired with this with this rehearsing at, in my in my room alone in silence just with me speaking so I had to reinvent myself a lot of times um, especially when when it was becoming very hard to to believe in myself so I, I want to go back to what you're saying because <clears throat> in preparing for a competition of course uh, it, it, you have done many professional performances so this is not exactly the same as rehearsing is it i mean what's the difference between going to an ensemble and rehearsing them and preparing them for a concert and going to a competition because in some ways it looks the same what what, what would you say might be the difference what do you have to try to communicate on the podium in a competition that's different from uh, simply a rehearsal but actually what I try to do is to treat the competition exactly as a rehearsal, exactly as a uh, professional rehearsal. Um, um, of course, that, that cannot happen. It, it cannot be the same. But my attitude was uh, of a rehearsal. I never thought of um, creating some sort of special um, show to be put on for the, for the jury, for the orchestra and for the audience. Um, of course, what I try to do is all the great moments that may happen in three, four or five days of rehearsal with an orchestra, I try to compress them as much as possible. And uh, when you have 10 minutes to rehearse a uh, half movement, half slow movement of a Haydn symphony, you need to uh, just compress and densify everything you want to say. But again, you can't say everything and you cannot spend your time saying things. So I try to show and then I tried just spontaneously. That's what actually improved through the competition, throughout the competition. I was less and less um, relying on my uh, just checkpoints that I had just in case um, I lose track uh, of, of the rehearsal. And I started to just um, um, interact with the present moment, with the sound and just listening to, to, to what was happening and try to change it as much as possible. Of course, in in the most connected way to the music 
in the moment where what the orchestra needed in the concentration um, level of the orchestra in the um, in the intensity perhaps when I was the last of the day I tried to be more dramatic in some things but also more um, releasing just letting go a lot of things so I just interrupt in the present moment but always treating the rehearsal as a rehearsal mm -hmm. and and of course another <coughs> I mean another disadvantage if you can call it that in in going to a, a competition is it's not your orchestra it's not your ensemble it's not people that you've been working with before tell us what it was like to work with the Bamberg Symphony Orchestra well the Bar Bamberg Symphonica were an extraordinary orchestra and I think um everybody in the competition agreed. Uh, not, I'm not talking, of course, about the um, musical and technical level, which is um, internationally uh, well known, but I'm talking about the attitude of the orchestra, who was um, incredibly reacting to everything we did. And I remember talking to other candidates and they, they all say the same, um, as well as their kindness, their openness. They were open to try out ideas. There was never once that I felt my ideas or my attempts uh, to create the idea unwelcomed. So, and this is of course incredibly important for not only for a young conductor, but for a young conductor in a competition. So they did a fantastic job with, with each one of us, I think. So just walk us through <laughs> a little bit, because I think it's important for the audience to realize that there was a fixed set of pieces that had to be conducted. Every conductor had to be, who was chosen to, to come to Bamberg, was expected to conduct any, any one of these and any combination of these pieces. They had to be performed again and again and again by the Bamberg under different conductors. How many of you uh, were invited to Bamberg and, and how did the process work? At the end, we were 19 invited um, and there were four rounds. Um, and uh, every time, every evening before the beginning of the round, we would gather <coughs> and uh, a member of the jury or of the um, staff would um, pick up uh, names and pieces and um, fragments of the piece because of course especially in the first rounds uh, you have not uh, you cannot uh, perform or rehearse the entire piece so um, there was an exact um, part of the of the piece and uh, and of course a time where you will be rehearsing and as you said yeah we had to prepare a long program throughout uh, thoroughly and um, and then just in the moment the evening before we will know um, what what we will, will we conduct and for how long, which is of course a, a very uh, big fragment of, of our planning as a, as conductors. We we really need to know what to do and in what um, amount of time we can do that. So it is it takes a lot of um, effort for the strategy to be to be ready. And we had very few hours. Some some of us very few hours. Some of us one day. But we had just not much time to to really get into that. And I think that's also a very important part of the competition. Your um, uh, invitation to come, as I understand it, wasn't simply for whatever rounds you made it to, right? I think, I think it's important also to stress that in Bamberg, uh, people have a chance who, who are coming, are invited for the entire week, regardless of their result. And I, I, th I understand there's quite a bit of contact between the, the uh, competitors and the jury. Absolutely, and I, I'm, I'm not an expert in international competitions, uh, but I have never heard of such a thing, uh, and it's it's really important to um, to say it. So yeah, thank you for for saying that because I think um, first of all the fact that we are all invited to stay, we are covered in all the costs, and of course this is amazing um, because not everyone has the the chance to to do that, and the competition where you have full access to all the rehearsals, even if you didn't pass the rounds, it's an incredible learning uh, experience. And of course, as you said, uh, full contact and full um, involvement by every member of the jury, who not only with the winner, but with every candidate, they are available at all time for uh, advices and counsel and uh, support. So that's very, very important. I find it unique. Yeah, I I was lucky enough to attend the the final performance <coughs> and, and meet many of the of the people who had been there that week, and everyone seemed very grateful to, and also the sense of camaraderie that we were 
just being there was the exciting part as well, and that there was much more to be taken from this than uh, um, than, than winning. I think the winning aspect was was something I felt among among everyone who had who had attended. Um, let me ask you a little bit about uh, um, <clears throat> the impact of of the award. I, I uh, this has as you as I mentioned um, going into the show today. This has often been a life changing event. That can take time, I realize, but uh, how have, have you been impacted by winning the, the Bomberg competition, the Mahler competition? Of course. Um, it has been um, a very intense. Um, the, 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 the last weeks were, were very intense, and I have got already um, a lot of planning going on. Of course, there are holidays now, so um, some, of, some of the invitations are waiting, but... Um, Indeed, uh, there is a very powerful resonance um, through theaters, orchestras, management, and um, so definitely the Mali competition is a life-changing um, experience. And um, of course, this is this is an aspect that um, it's just. Of course, it is like that. Um, a lot of orchestras know about this competition; they followed it. Um, and uh, there, there is, a, of course, a, also a media resonance. But at the same time, if I may say, it is also incredibly important for, for um, uh, perception of, uh, of ourselves. So, you know, I've, I've, I've had a lot of people writing, writing me, like, finally. Yeah, there was just the, the, the little step you, or of course, huge step, but just the little step we were waiting for you uh, to happen, we knew you you're gonna do it anyway. But this this is the step that that was supposed to happen now, and so um, this came from really hundreds of people around me, and so of course it has been wonderful uh, weeks after the competition. Oh, that that's wonderful. Uh, before we go, I have to of course ask you: this is a Mahler competition. Maybe you want to say a few words about your relationship to the great composer. Um, it is indeed a very special relationship um, that, that I had with the composer. I, I, I can't say it is a full, um, full life love, like I, I, a lifelong um, love, because I, I've never listened to a symphony of Mahler before I was, I think, 19 or 20. And that symphony was, um, there was uh, the second. And it was just a random event. I was already, I, I moved to another city. I was with my mentor and we were in a way, you know, the, the ancient Greek sort of mentor. We were spending full time together all the time. Uh, we were discussing music, reading, experiencing, thinking just all the time together. And one day, just randomly, he puts a CD. It was Stokowski conducting uh, the Mahler Second. And we were doing a long drive so um, we arrive at home and i think it was already the last 15 minutes of the of the symphony and we without saying a word he just turned off the car and we could not um move and talk and we just listened to this unbelievable finale which i i had no idea existed something like that <laughs> and uh, after it finished um it we stayed in silence for a long time not only in the car, but also when getting out. The, the, I, I'm feeling now moved, even remembering this experience. It was so powerful. Um, and so that, that had a huge impact. And the symphony became my absolutely favorite. And I stopped listening to anything else. I became very drastic in my Mahler love. And then right after I auditioned for the Gustav Mahler Jugend Orchestra, um, and then the first symphony, which we performed was Mahler second with Jonathan Knott. Um, so it was very, very powerful. I was just 21, I think, um, and we toured, toured with him. And then with the Mahler Orchestra, with the Gustav Mahler Jugend, I performed also Mahler nine in tour, and there was another experience. I, I tried to not to listen to the symphony before going in rehearsal, so I was completely uh, ignorant on the symphony. So to have the maximum impact on, on on the rehearsal and it was absolutely shocking and uh, this, this music is out of this world and so this the, the relationship grew up th through these experiences and it was very powerful every time I, I experienced something 
with Mahler was, was very intense. So th there is a, a connection, even though it started a bit late, there is a very powerful connection to the composer. And I, I, can't, I, I can't resist asking, you ended up uh, this year, the, 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 this time around, the, the Mahler work in question was the seventh, which is considered one of the most difficult pieces, both to perform and, and, to, <coughs> and even to listen to. Uh, did you find that especially challenging? Was it something you relished or this is a piece that you've uh, always liked? It's a piece I never heard of before um, being invited to the competition. Um, as I said, I maybe maybe it's a, I don't know, a wrong strategy, but I try not to get to know every piece of music, every masterpiece that there is as soon as possible because I want to let them come to me in the right time and to let them sink in, in the right time. So Mother 7 didn't have a chance before for performances or concerts I didn't listen to. I was not in the program, otherwise I would have probably went. So <laughs> I, I had, of course, difficulties at the beginning, um, especially, I, I would say, with every movement, you know. Um, of course, the fifth is the, the, the one that uh, there is a huge discussion still today. Um, but um, every movement, even the first, I had a hard time understanding this music. It took me a lot of time to get into it, and but now I, I love it um, more more than probably anything. Probably, of course, is the the relationship at the moment. It's gonna it's gonna change. It's gonna be like that for many pieces. But um, um, even the fifth movement, I think, is an absolute masterpiece, and it it's just very hard to perform. And that's also what I try to do in, a comp in the competition, not to let myself um, sit in the knowledge, in the, in the fact that com conductors need to conduct a piece. And maybe there, there was Karayan saying that um, you, Rosen Cavalier, perhaps I think it was the quote that he, you can understand it only after the 20th time that you conduct it. Mm -hmm. So um, Mahler 7, I think, is one of those cases where you need time, time, time to conduct in time to understand. But nevertheless, I try to get past this even in my preparation and to really perform it in my in my room um, in silence and to really feel the tension and the very slow building up of the fifth fifth movement, for example, but also the first. I think it's a very controlled um, symphony in a way decadent, in a way hoping, but it's, it's very controlling and we have to, in a way, wear this control and then be free of it, but we need to understand it. It's very hard. I think the hardest thing for the symphony is this one, to really have a very, very um, long sight uh, to, to perform it properly. Yeah. Uh, I did have one more question, but we have to, I think, keep it short. Any advice for aspiring conductors? Because I know many people will be watching you and uh, who are young and of course are are dreaming of, of moving ahead in this way. Any, any quick piece of advice for them? I'll try to be extremely short. And I think the first of all things is um, find a real reason to be a conductor. Find a motivation, something that brings you on, on the podium and why would you be there? Is there a reason? Is there a real reason for you to be there? Because a conductor, I believe, has to be a complete egoless and a complete serving activity. You can't be the center of the attention. You have to be, in a way, let the attention slide far away from you. you, you so that, that's my philosophy. And of course, you can agree or not. But I think that's the first thing, because it's going to motivate you um, throughout all the years. Um, then, of course, work incredibly hard. Uh, if you are an orchestra musician, then your advantage, in a way, work with a lot of orchestras and try to understand um, as much as possible what is the conductor doing and why is he doing something and what could be done better or differently. Write down everything. And um, if you're not an orchestra musician, go to all the rehearsals and, and of course, study very intensively scores and go beyond uh, articulations to start to understand uh, the, the deeper lines that there are, uh, structure, harmony, and, and of course the flow of the music is something that comes later. Um, and practice a lot of, we build a small ensemble, five people, four people, doesn't matter, and conduct to, to understand the relationship between your mind, your body, and the sound that you produce. 
and try to change that in in the first in the first moment you do it of course it's not going to happen you're going to need a lot of time to get used to the delay of the sound and the interaction with the sound but keep going keep going everything is a practice even even the confidence in front of an orchestra conducting is a practice everything you can imagine is just something you can practice so you will be demotivated a lot of times but just keep going keep working very hard and ask is also ask a lot of people ask what should they do what could i have done better not only the orchestra but teachers and um and, and people around and ask the conductors themselves um, and obviously find a great teacher that can guide you but um, it's the work that you do within yourself that counts at the end the most thank you so much for being with us today giuseppe a pleasure thank you Let's continue exploring the <coughs> Valda competition by welcoming its co-founder and a loyal friend of the show, Marina Mahler, the composer's granddaughter. Welcome, Marina. Hello. <laughs> what did you think of Giuseppe Mengele's work and performance at the competition? Well, I want to say first that um, all that he said right now, uh, it moved me very much, actually very much. Um, because of its huge sincerity. And um, I, I agree about this, that uh, it is not, of course, an ego thing. It is maybe the opposite, is how to lose oneself and go through the music and out. And that's, that's a, a, an Im immense gift. <laughs> and uh, um, we, we all know conductors who do the opposite, uh, you know, but... Um, let it be. You, you learn and learn and learn, and then you let go of it, and then it comes by itself out. And um, I, I was very moved by um, Giuseppe from, from the beginning, from this truth that he has within himself, and uh, uh, incredibly modest, but not modest shy, but modest true. Uh, to himself, to to what he was doing, and so um, uh, it 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 was altogether a very beautiful uh, process. Uh, watching it was watch wonderful watching all all of the young people, and it, it's a it's an extraordinary to me that we have been going since two thousand four, um, and what it means um, is very beautiful because it just gives young musicians and conductors a chance to test themselves in front of a, a truly generous and, and uh, uh, extraordinary orchestra, giving them time and interest, as Giuseppe said. And uh, the atmosphere from the beginning has been very, uh, I would even say very emotional and very devoted. Uh, as much from the jury members who came as from, from the young people who came. And the fact that they can all stay is, I think, absolutely key because they get to know each other. And, and it's a growing process. Um, I always think it's a pity we have to wait another three years. And after this one, we were discussing, it would be wonderful to have for those who were not quite ready or not on, on the point of winning, but extremely gifted. It would be wonderful to have an interim uh, workshop space with a couple of orchestras, uh, the youth orchestras or even uh, orchestras related to Mahler, but I was thinking it could be done perhaps in a place like Spoleto, which has uh, infinite uh, two theaters and, the, and, and, and it has uh, every possible uh, space you might need and venue for, for this to happen. Well, we wouldn't be talking about the Bamberg Mahler competition if it weren't uh, for you and a few other people. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how this all got started. I would like to because, um, so Ernest Fleischmann, who was a very, very long time with the uh, LA Phil, um, became a friend and he used to visit me in Spoleto. Uh, he spent a few, a couple, uh, even three uh, New Year's Eves and um, sometimes with a different, he would come with a different, with a, with, 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 with a, a wonderful woman and so, but we used to talk and talk and talk. And he said to me, because he had of course many friends throughout all the orchestras, you know, directors of orchestras, uh, San Francisco and so on. 
And he said to me, I think it would be wonderful if we had a, a competition. And uh, the Bamberg Symphony Orchestra might be w willing to do it. Uh, Jonathan Knott is, is great, became a, a very close friend. And the orchestra itself is, of course, a Mahler orchestra from its earliest times. That's something that isn't quite recognized. And I think it's not quite fair. Um, it should be more talked about because, of course, it, it, it is, a, first of all, an, an amazing orchestra. But the, the setup there in Bamberg with, with a very warm public, um, a, a beautiful uh, town, not bombed, luckily, a beautiful town on the river and a, and a beautiful concert hall. The first time we went, and also it was with Paul Müller, who at the time was the uh, was, was in the place of um, uh, now today, uh, Marcus Axt, who is also fantastic with his absolute uh, warmth and uh, welcoming all the young people, all everybody. And uh, it means a great deal to him. It meant a great deal to Paul Müller, who was quite silent a person, hugely emotional, but very shy. And um, it was a wonderful beginning. Um, uh, the, the, our first winner was, was uh, um, Gustavo uh, Dudamel, and but I will never forget uh, the jury and the walks there and back to the concert hall and the talks with all the young people because from beginning to end, we as the jury, we, we have uh, an ongoing uh, dialogue with everyone who is there, all the young people who, who are there. And... Uh, it's very fascinating and incredibly moving to hear how they got there, why they are there, how they began, what they are dreaming, what, where, is, where are they imagining, uh, uh, putting all their musical efforts uh, uh, and why. And uh, for me, it was very important that <laughs> the first year we asked everybody, all the contestants, we said, please bring a piece of music from somebody uh, living, a living composer from your country. And that was a bit of a disaster. <laughs> the pieces, I mean, they were, they, it was really uh, not on the level. And so that's when we began commissioning and uh, commissioning composers to write to be specifically for the competition. And that or it went much, much better. And then there was a prize at that time, only for a year of because I thought it's very important to give a prize to the person who conducts best contemporary music. After all, Mahler was once in that position of being a contemporary composer with nobody knowing what his music meant. He had a difficult time with audiences, with people, oh, yeah, a devoted small group around him. But for me, that has always been important part of Mahler and his life as a composer and musician is the fact of the creation of the actual piece of music, not, the not just the conducting of it. And so this year was wonderful because we, we decided that uh, we would give, uh, again, reanimate this and give an award for new music. So I think um, I have a lot of sentimental and wonderful memories, but also I have kept in touch from the beginning with many of these young conductors and we interact uh, in different ways. Um, Kachung Wong and I did a, did a project in uh, Singapore uh, for little children because he came to stay in Spoleto <laughs> uh, in a very funny way. I don't have time now to say it or tell it, but it's a wonderful story anyway. He's a sweet person. And uh, so we had, it was the end of festival we had fireworks on my, my terrace, best view of them in, in the town. And then he came down and we started talking until late. And he said, what is this smaller foundation? And I said, well, it's something to do with infinitude. So the next morning he came down to breakfast with his computer. On the computer was a complete project called Project Infinitude with text and photos of him with little children. And, whatever. and we worked it out together. And I said, we'll do it. And that was just a personal, because it was so beautiful. Now, we did it for four months. Immediately, the government in Singapore took it over. They wanted to sponsor it, and they've done it since then. And he wants to go on. And now he will be conducting in the Halley Orchestra. And uh, now he's at the Japan Philharmonic. And he's about to do Mahler 3. And I promised him a video.
but I've kept, you know, Lahav, and I've kept in touch with um, a lot of people also who didn't win the first prize, like Oksana Linev. And um, it's very rewarding to see their development and how that's helped them to reach out on whatever level, whether they won prize or didn't win a prize, it has made an impact. And so I'm, I'm thrilled, of course, and, and yeah. makes me very, very happy. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I know that uh, from having attended a few of these competitions, how much they're uh, grateful to you as well. And the fact that they've been able to come together and that there's this incredible, well, by now you can call it a tradition and, and uh, yes. continuous yes. in so many different directions. It's not just music performance. It's also, as you say, this project for children and uh, remaining connected and feeling that, uh, they're welcomed so warmly by you. Uh, you are, uh, looking at the website, the competition patron and honorary jury member. You're there all the time uh, for all of them. And I know how much it means to them. And as we can see to the musical world. So I think on behalf of everyone involved, I'd like to say thank you. <laughs> and uh -huh. so I'd like to thank you for uh, being our guest today. Thank you so much, Marina. Thank you. That means so much to me. <laughs> thank you. As Marina mentioned, the competition is hosted and run by the Bamberg Symphony Orchestra. Markus Axt is the president and CEO of that organization. He cannot be with us today, but he has sent us his greetings. Markus Axt will be able to tell us much more when he joins us later this season for an entire Mahler Hour dedicated to the Bamberg Symphony Orchestra. And uh, just a reminder, if you are with us live, uh, feel free to send us questions through the chat. We will be happy to answer in a Q&A at the end of the hour so that you can direct those questions to any of our guests today. So joining me now is the chairman of Mahler Foundation, Martin Campbell-White. Welcome, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Hello, everybody. You have been a juror now uh, at the competition for um, two rounds. Uh, tell us a little bit about your three, experience. Actually. Three. Three rounds. Oh, that's right. Yeah. We did one virtually. That's right. I've forgotten that one. Three rounds. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, first of all, it's, you think it's going to be easy sitting on your backside with people who, with whom you develop a good, good uh, rapport, friendship. Uh, and you have uh, nice uh, breaks, coffee, tap, chats. But in fact, it is incredibly intense uh, to listen to 19 musicians, 19 aspiring conductors, for instance, on this last uh, occasion, uh, performing uh, pieces by uh, uh, something from a Haydn symphony, something very significant from uh, a uh, Mahler seventh uh, movement. Uh, contemporary piece by Deutsch, which incidentally uh, Mahler Foundation uh, sponsored the prize. Uh, and I think we're, we're going to speak to the yes. prize winner shortly. Uh, and um, uh, it, it, after you, you begin to uh, develop a relationship, uh, emotional relationship almost with some of the prize, uh, some of the contestants, <laughs> you can see their nerves. And you can also see how they, once they get into the music, once they get absorbed into the score, that they shed those nerves. And then you can really see how they're working. Uh, and you can also discern whether they're totally sincere. Marina talked about sincerity, and so did Giuseppe. I was very impressed with that. Uh, and you can see how they react to the way the orchestra reacts. Uh, and so you develop a view which may not be in total agreement with your colleagues, but uh, at least once you come out of the session, you can sit down and you can discuss with colleagues how, uh, and then you come to a, a sort of common, uh, a common view, which leads to the next round. But that for 10 days is pretty intensive, I can assure you. And uh, I felt totally drained uh, at the end of, uh, after the final concert. Uh, it, it is, I, I think, yes, I, I think it is <laughs> hard for people to uh, imagine how you judge um, a conductor in front of an orchestra. You've mentioned some of the qualities 
And mm -hmm. I know that there, are, again, will be pe people watching who uh, would love to compete next time around. Um, what, what should they keep in mind? What are, what it, or to put it another way, what are the most important criteria for choosing uh, a winner? Well, for me, it's uh, it, the belief in the music uh, is, must be palpable. The desire to communicate your ideas to the orchestra in front of you. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, in parenthesis, I'd like to say that uh, it's pretty difficult. It has been pretty difficult for aspiring young conductors during the last three years. They've had precious little opportunity because of the dreaded COVID. Yes. And so you could see that there are some really gifted people who came in front of the orchestra and uh, were in the competition. We wanted them to continue, but they didn't have enough practical experience. They didn't, weren't able to make their hands convey what their heads definitely had, which is going to be very interesting. <laughs> and that comes with practice. That comes with doing it over and over again with whatever orchestra. Uh, and I think some of them were just uh, at the beginning, a little bit like startled rabbits in front of this world-class Bamberger, Bamberger Symphonica. Uh, and that's uh, unfortunate, but the talent will out. So I hope that now COVID is over, the, the next uh, uh, batch of uh, uh, contestants will uh, have more practice uh, under their belt and will have more, even more confidence to display their views and their belief in the music. I hope I... that's not too vague, but... Uh, I, I... I hope I've given an impression. Well, you touch on, I, there were two things I wanted to ask about that. One was, of course, the, the, the rather, um, you know, uh, these uh, adjectives that point to a kind of mystical connection between the orchestra and the conductor and the notion of commitment. And, 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 uh, and these are all ephemeral in some ways. And mm -hmm. yet it's, uh, it's important for the jurors to pick up on that. I, I don't I think we're going to answer that question today, but th I think that's a fascinating question is what communicates that type of connectivity uh, and and sincerity? Um, I don't know if you have any initial thoughts on that. Well, uh, I'm reminded of uh, one of the dear departed conductors whom I represented. He uh, he never uh, wanted to talk about the art of conducting, but uh, one day he was feeling pretty relaxed. So somebody said, go on, tell us, what, what, what's your view? He said, oh, it's very simple. Three things. Believe in the music. Don't talk too much. And just occasionally, just occasionally, tell the brass they're too loud. That's all. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> I well, think you can, uh, you can over-elaborate. Belief, don't talk all the time because these musicians... They know what to do. They want guidance, uh, and they uh, and they're so happy to find a new kid, new person, woman or man on the block who's giving them some interesting ideas. But through the hands, through the stick technique, not necessarily talking all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and you, the other topic you touched on, and and of course you being, uh, of course. Um, <laughs> involved in representing so many of the great conductors in the world today. Do you feel that the young people uh, after COVID are getting those chances? I wanted to follow up with that observation as well. Has the industry changed significantly enough that we should be worried or is it all bouncing back? No, I, I think it's bouncing back. There were, there were lots of doomsayers who were saying, oh, the days of Mahler performances are over. We'll never have so many musicians on stage. But the Mahler performance is absolutely everywhere at the moment. Yeah. So, yes, I think it's come back. And I think there are lots of smaller orchestras uh, where the younger younger people, I mean, even, you know, they couldn't get into their colleges. They couldn't go to their conservatoires uh, and, yeah. and work with the orchestras there because of COVID. So it's been a bad time and it's definitely better. Yeah, good. Uh, so tell us about this special prize that Mahler Foundation um, um, sponsored at the Bamberg Mahler Festival. Well, uh, I, on behalf of the foundation, approached uh, Marcus Rudolf Axt. I've known him for a long, long time. Uh, he was uh, artistic administrator in Bamberg, and then he went to become artistic administrator with the Berlin Philharmonic. So our friendship goes back a long way. 
Uh, and we felt that we wanted to have a more tangible uh, um, association with the uh, competition, the Mala Foundation. It's called, it's, it's called now called the Mala Competition, anyhow, which is wonderful. Uh, and therefore, we offered uh, a, a modest sum uh, as a prize for the best performance of the contemporary piece uh, commissioned by Bamberger Symphonica uh, uh, by Deutsch, uh, a German composer. An interesting piece. He actually uh, was asked to write it uh, as a form of encore. Uh, so he was given a, 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 not a precise time uh, scale, but uh, I don't think uh, he, I think he was asked to keep within seven or eight minutes anyhow. And it's a very, uh, it's a brilliant piece, plenty of rhythm, uh, and uh, you need to be extremely pre precise when rehearsing it. And just to be uh, more specific, this prize was given to the, um, any of the, of the people who entered the competition, uh, who uh, had the performance yes. of that work during <laughs> the competition at any stage of yes. the competition. Yeah, they all had to perform it the first round. Uh, and therefore all 19 contestants uh, 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 did it. Uh, and uh, we had to bear in mind uh, who uh, gave, uh, who, who in our view gave the best performance. Uh, and uh, there was quite a lot of discussion, uh, but I'm happy to say, uh, 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 yeah, uh, arrogant enough to say that uh, uh, my, my view prevailed. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think, I can't remember who else, but anyhow, we came eventually to the view that Kevin Fitz, Fitzgerald uh, gave the uh, most uh, uh, um, convincing rehearsal and then performance of the piece. Uh, and we also were very impressed with the way he uh, got through the score, rehearsed it very methodically uh, and clearly totally understood the music. Well, I, I'm gonna thank you because we're gonna move right along uh, to the winner of that. Prize. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you, Martin. And as I said, here uh, is the winner of that special prize of Mahler Foundation at the Bamberg Mahler Festival for a contem con contemporary piece, Kevin Fitzgerald. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Martin. How are you? Good. Good to see you again. Well, before we start talking about the specific prize, tell us a little bit about coming to, to Bamberg in general. Well, I've been to Germany several times, but never to Bamberg. And it's a beautiful, beautiful city with lots of history and beautiful streets. And of course, the crown jewel, the Bamberger Symphonica. So it was a beautiful town. And your uh, being invited to the competition was, of course, in itself a competition, right? I mean, there were many, many applicants. And so uh, how did you feel when you said, uh, hey, I'm in? It was a great day. Um, I definitely felt uh, deeply recognized. Uh, I, the Mahler competition is among all conducting competitions, very sacred and um, very special. And so I felt like a winner, especially being of only one of three Americans to be uh, invited. It was a great honor. So uh, as we just discussed, as I discussed with Martin Campbell-White, the uh, the idea of the award that Mahler Foundation uh, gave was uh, not to look at any particular you know, group, uh, to look at all 19 of you and to determine uh, the prize for the best performance of the contemporary work. This is a piece by Bernd Richard Deutsch called Konmoto. Um, so did you, first of all, did you know about the prize uh, as you headed into this or were you of course uh, preparing it like any other piece? Well, I knew the prize existed. Um, it was listed on the website, but of course I was eyeing for the first prize like all of us were. <laughs> right. um, but this prize really was perfect for me. Um, since the beginning of my entry into, into conducting, um, and Giuseppe mentioned having a very strong um, mission as a conductor, why you're doing this and contemporary music and bringing new works um, and you know works that between 1900 and today have been written that really reflect modern life. Those have been at the forefront of my focus. And that was really my impetus to start conducting and in, in addition to playing trumpet. So um, it was a perfect opportunity to showcase that at the competition. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, and, and so that people are, are aware, you uh, were not only given the prize, you actually were able to perform this at the final concert, which of course, the rest of which was conducted by uh, Giuseppe Mengele. That must have been quite a thrill as well. That was the icing on the cake. It was truly, I mean, the award was in the recognition was such an honor, but getting to give a world premiere, I mean, that's what I, I dream about doing all the time. Um, and to be have a composer living there, living with us, hearing the music, giving feedback, working with him one-on-one, -on -one, uh, that was a complete delight. And, you know, it was the, my first time performing in a concert in Europe. So I think we have a photo. I, not to interrupt. I just, I just, I think we have a photo here of of you uh, uh, at the concert, not only conducting but also being congratulated by the composer. Oh, are you gonna? Oh, yeah, I'm gonna try to put you on. There you go. Oh, there's 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 Bernd. Yeah, great guy. We've stayed in touch, and he's. I have a huge stack of his scores here on on my shelf from Boozy and Hawks, so I have quite a bit of notes to learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, this is another example of how this, uh, this, this, these connections um, will go on, right? In 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 careers and how these how you get interwoven, um, uh, much more long term than perhaps one expects for after a ten day event like this. Absolutely, it is already in the short time that it's been revolutionized my future, um, in in practical ways like management and engagements, but more so. Yeah, uh, personally, um, you know, coming from America where we are, you know, we are building our own cultural tradition, but essentially are still um, building on the European influence that, that started uh, so many years ago. And so it felt very uh, deep sense of recognition and affirmation to continue as an artist and as a conductor. Uh, and, you know, that my, it gave me, re-energized my mission statement, so to speak. That's wonderful. Well, um, thank you for talking with us today, Kevin. We have some questions at the end here, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to probably be inviting uh, some or all of the guests back at the, at the end. So, uh, as I said, uh, I'm going to turn to the audience now for any questions uh, you might have. There are some that have come in uh, over the course of the show, so I will begin uh, with them. But please don't hesitate to um, literally you have your chance now to interact with the guests directly and live. Um, all right, so I'm going to begin. I'm going to ask Giuseppe to come back. The question I have here from Anthony Raumann is, how has Gustav Mahler's works influenced Giuseppe? How has it influenced you as a composer? Oh, that's a very unique question. Um, you know, not, not, in a, not in a direct way, not in a um, sort of or, or orchestration or or style in, in, in creating tension, but rather again in the core of the music, what, 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 when the music tries to um, stretch the, the, human, the human mind and human soul, and then when, when it settles again, and then when it brings it again to the very, very verge of exploding, I'm not talking about volume, but I'm talking about inner tension. And that's something um, Mahler does incredibly. Um, but also the stillness of certain moments. I remember Mahler 8, for example, uh, the, when there is the moment with the celesta and it sounds uh, truly like a, like a um, divine lullaby or something like that. And then, and this, this influenced me in just creating more rooms in, in the mind of, of human feelings and human um, um, spheres of colors and emotions. So that, that would be the, 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 the influence. And also, since I didn't know the, Wagner, the, the Wagner's uh, masterpieces at the time, I would say Mahler music in a way brought me back in time. I also started to um, get influenced by Tristan without knowing it, what it was Tristan, but it was Tristan through Mahler, for example. <laughs> yeah, of course, that's always interesting how you discover that um, you're plugging into something that uh, is, is further back, so to speak. Uh, and Wagner, of course, the giant. I have another question for you, uh, Giuseppe, from um, John David van der Werth in Sweden. 
Uh, I'd love to know more about your initial analysis of the score from the conductor's position. Uh, could you explain how this differs from other situations? And I'm not quite sure what other situations or different situations might mean in this context, but I suppose different from, I don't know, listening to it, analyzing it, or playing it. How is the conductor's analysis different? I, I think that's what the question is. Um, I, I would say conductor's analysis has to touch many aspects of the composition. Um, not only the practical practical aspect of um, volumes and um, bureaucracy in a way, you know, the, the the hierarchy of who is leading, who is the main voice, who is the color, who is the answer and so on, but goes deeper and deeper into um, relating all those things and to go beyond uh, the sections, the notes and, and to find then something, some sort of red line that brings everything uh, together into, into the performance. So um, the conductor has to be, of course, very practical. Uh, the conductor has to be very practical to, to understand who is doing what, who is leading, uh, who is the, the rhythmical uh, pulsation of the piece, who, um, who is creating a change of color and so on the articulations, the difference to understand the language of a composer. That's also very important and to, um, to understand why is he writing something like that and why, why not a second time, et cetera, et cetera. So putting relationships in, in relation, all, all the arches of um, harmony, of repetition of one thing and when, when it's changing or not, and harmony structure going deeper and deeper and deeper. And then the conductor really has to find in the analysis, like it's not a feeling, it's not something, it's not only a feeling, it's not something you feel, but it's something you really have to find in the music, how everything is brought together. What is the link in between every section? And you have to find a reason for that. It cannot be just a gut feeling coming from, from your musical experience, but it really needs to find a reason. Then we go beyond our, um, our inner ear, our recordings, um, um, backgrounds and listening and concert performing and so on. We go beyond that and we find our uh, truth in the score. So that's, that's the, the work. And of course, the last step is, is translating that truth to uh, and communicating it back to the orchestra and, and <coughs> hearing, hearing that, of course. Um, I have another question for Giuseppe from Mark Strawn in the UK. I'm intrigued that you prefer not to know the piece too well before conducting. I'm not sure that's what you said, but perhaps as a listener, I prefer to know the music when I go to a concert. Do you learn quickly? <laughs> I, I might have then uh, misspoken myself. No, I didn't mean that. Of course, before performing as a conductor, I practice very hard in every possible way that I can. Uh, because since I am the... And the person to, to guide the orchestra, I really need to know um, every possible aspect at the time. Sometimes it takes, uh, sometimes you're, you're being called a day before a rehearsal yeah. and you need to work as hard as possible, but you we will never bring something, if you don't, if you never had the piece before and you accept you, you will never bring something out of this world, perhaps, or perhaps, yes, some, some divine uh, uh, knowledge comes to you. But uh, in general, I take a lot of time studying uh, on every perspective. What I meant was in my violinist time, when I was playing in orchestra, when I knew I would have, for example, two weeks of rehearsal section, and then, and then, and then string orchestra, and then orchestra rehearsal, I knew I had a lot of time, and I knew technically it would not be a problem for me, so I just practiced my part briefly, and I, just to be in shape for the orchestra rehearsals, but I didn't listen to the full piece. I did the same with with uh, Bruckner Ninth Symphony, for example, and the and the, um, the parts that are incredibly uh, special harmonically are were a mystery to me until they put in right. in place, and then they 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 got a different meaning because they had a different meaning before, and then that meaning got translated into into something else. So that's what I meant. Uh, sometimes, as a violinist, I do that be because of an experience, because I did that out of. Um, um, an impossibility to be prepared because I was called last moment. I got called to do Tristan uh, as a co-leader. Tristan um, on Isolde, just the, just the overture and the Lieberstadt. And so I listened to this piece of music for the first time sitting in orchestra and we played through 
with the conductor because it was the last moment before the break. And this was such a shocking experience that I, we were in the middle of the woods. I went out and I had to iso isolate myself and I, and I had a sort of a, what I think Nietzsche called uh, the, the, the hysterical awakening of feelings that the mankind has forgotten since a lot of time and <laughs> brought, brought back. I had something, some experience inside myself that I could not uh, explain. And it was a 15 minutes of a good cry uh, for the entire break. Um, so in a way, I just wanted to give a chance myself to experience something like that once again, because the real sound experience playing, experiencing playing with the real sound around you a symphony, a masterpiece for the first time is, a, is an incredible privilege that you cannot repeat anywhere else in your life. Once you have listened to it, it's, it's there. So that's, that's just what I meant. But conducting, I practice, I swear. <laughs> no, I, it's a bit like, a, it's a, I mean, it sounds like almost a, not only a mystical, but sort of a, an experience of, of um, hyper awareness and go, when you go into it. And of course, all the more effective when that happens. I have some questions also for uh, Kevin. Um, Daniel from Poland writes, I would love to hear what was Kevin's relationship with Mahler before the competition and how it has changed after it? It's a beautiful question. Well, I am a trumpet player. And so Mahler has been part of my life um, since I became serious about the instrument, um, you know, from every Mahler symphony has an epic trumpet part. Obviously, I've spent many hours playing, but it um, but it um, you know, for the from the fifth, um, growing up uh, in Michigan, which is you know very close to Chicago, one of the first CDs I had was Chicago Symphony playing Mahler's first symphony with George Schulte, and their brass section had such a tradition, still does to this day. Um, so you know, Chicago Mahler trumpet, it was all kind of married together. And now as a conductor, um, especially after doing the competition, um, I, I, what I love about it so much, I, so many things, but there is an equal level of intellectual complexity, which I love as a new music person, is equal to the extreme emotional power. Um, the music is so well crafted and um, it's all pointing towards expression. So it's it's really great, and I, I I empathize with Mahler so much because he was really pushing the envelope. I mean, especially if you look at the seventh. I mean, he's doing things, writing things that had never been thought of. The the distance, the gulf between six and seven, uh, <laughs> is so wide, and I think he got a little scared at how far he pushed himself in seven and eight. Although it's massive, is more traditional in its musical values. So um, anyway. Uh, I hope that in the near future, I can conduct some full symphonies, which I have yet to do in a concert. So uh, yeah, Mahler will be part of my life forever, I'm sure. It sounds like, of course, as a performer, and this this is uh, something we have in common with Giuseppe, and I think many of the of the, of the people who came, uh, Mahler was a part of your life as a, as a professional musician because it's almost, uh, you know, thankfully unavoidable. And you have a very... Uh, your unique relationship, of course, through your instrument. I think the strings and the trumpet um, uh, and other brass are particularly, I think, enamored of of, of Mahler. So it sounds like it it changed only in, the, in in deepening your respect, but in but it's certainly in terms of being familiar. That's there was nothing particularly new about that. Absolutely, absolutely, and I mean, the seventh, uh, the trumpet part is is particularly harrowing. And I've never had a chance to play that, but I did get a chance to play the third uh, and the post horn solo off stage. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, Mahler is very, you can't not feel everything when you listen to Mahler. <laughs> I, I have a question from uh, uh, Ulrich uh, Müller Sedgwick. Uh, are you still practicing your conducting by conducting to recordings? What are the pros and cons? Uh, and he writes from uh, Toblach in in Italy. Is this for both of us or should I you, answer? It's for you, Kevin. Oh, it's for me. Um, recordings are, as Giuseppe mentioned, uh, they play a very important role in the conductor's study process, but I don't personally believe it is good to conduct along with them. Um, you really should be focused on your inner 
concept of how the music should sound. However, that being said, especially something like Mahler, where there are so many interpretive choices to make, it would be silly not to hear what the great artists have to think. And even um, Giulini, the great Giulini, he said uh, to my teacher who studied with him, you know, why would you not take a masterclass with a great conductor by listening to their work? Mm-hmm. However, I, I will tell, uh, put it to this questioner to listen to Mahler 7 with some different conductors, because I think of all the symphonies, you will hear the most wide interpretations, uh, a huge range of interpretations. Um, so yeah, uh, very much listening a lot, but not moving to that because it's not coming, the sound you're hearing has nothing to do with your natural uh, gestures. Okay, great. Uh, and then I have a question for Martin. I think this is for Martin. Uh, again, this is from Anthony Rauman in uh, the UK. Um, Martin, how, yeah. and maybe th- this is maybe a technical question that should be best answered by Marcus Ox, who's not with us today. How, um, who selects the pieces for the competition, I suppose is one question. And, and then of course, uh, why why those are, are being selected. I had, do you have any insight into that? Well, first of all, of course, there's a tradition uh, for every competition that there must be a Mahler piece. Uh, secondly, I think there's a definitely a, a now an established tradition that it's good to have a singer. We've had Barbara Hannigan uh, singing uh, Mahler for last time. She was on the jury this time. Uh, thirdly, uh, um, it's the Bamberg Symphony who choose the contemporary uh, the, the com- composer for the contemporary work. Um, but uh, uh, there, is, there are one or two, I'm not going to name names, but there are one or two members of the jury who have been there for quite some time uh, who help discuss with the chairman, who happens to be the principal conductor of the Bamberger Symphonica, Jakob Puscher, who is the chairman of our jury. And so I, I think I'd say it's an inside job, essentially, with, with Marcus Axt, with uh, Jakob Puscher, uh, consulting some of the senior members of the jury, not me, I hasten to add. <laughs> but it's clearly a, a very sort of representative sampling of music from the 18th century through to today. And I think that with Mahler as, of course, a centerpiece and meant to challenge conductors uh, in very many different styles. Mm. So, yeah, seems to be. I mean, uh, we're going we're to be running out of Mahler symphonies fairly soon though. I'm not sure we can actually have Mahler 8 in the competition. That would be a challenge. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see yeah. what the future holds. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I have to uh, move on to uh, uh, just a few announcements. Uh, and, um, and because we're well past the hour, uh, let me just um, tell everyone there are many exciting Mahler projects coming up this fall. Uh, here are just a few that also involve Mahler Foundation. The arts group Bold Tendencies, based in London, will be featuring the Philharmonia Orchestra performing Mahler's First Symphony on the 17th of September in its ongoing program entitled Crisis. 16. The Festival Gustav Mahler in Milan, Italy, is being presented from 22 October to 13 November, featuring all of Mahler's symphonic works performed by the leading Italian symphony orchestras. The program also includes the song cycles and Mahler's reworkings of the symphonies by Robert Schumann. And finally, the Beijing Music Festival will also be taking place this year, and we will have much more to say about it on our next show in October. The Mahler Hour is brought to you by Mahler Foundation and contributors around the world. It is a monthly streaming event bringing together individuals interested in the composer, the thinker, the humanist, Gustav Mahler, as we explore not only his life and works, but also how his legacy still informs the essential aspects of the human experience and how we can turn that experience into a force for the good in today's world become a member and support our activities. Finally, I want to thank our guests, Giuseppe Mengele, Marina Mahler, Martin Campbell-White, Kevin Fitzgerald for joining us today, as well as our one-person production team, Marco Ayala, and our community uh, community manager, and Monica Anghiano, our executive director for administration. Mahler Hour is back on October 14th, live from China, as we bring you the Mahler Foundation Festival Orchestra from the Beijing Music Festival. I hope you can join us. That's our program for today. Stay safe. Thanks for watching.